this something up. All right, so, you know, I'm gonna give you my usual spiel about, um, about registering for classes. I suspect that people in, in this class are, are pretty good already and you've identified the classes that you want to take and hopefully you've, um, you've registered for them already. Um, and if not, if something is, is closed or you can't get into a class or there's some other type of commotion going on, please, please, please speak to me, all right? Sorry, and, and one thing I also wanted to mention is, um, please do take advantage of fall two. If you haven't already registered for classes for fall two, um, see what your life is looking like and, and perhaps you can squeeze in a class there in the six week session. Um, there's, you know, not the enrollment isn't that great in fall two. So um, there are classes that are still open. I'm also encouraging this because, you know, if you are already in a class for fall two and the class numbers are not that high, these are classes that could end up getting canceled, which throws a whole lot of problems into people's lives because they're banking on the classes being there. So, um, you know, so I'm saying maybe you've already registered, but if you have friends who haven't registered or family or other people who are at LaGuardia that you know, please encourage everyone to register for the fall and for the spring. Um, if you are going to end up doing an in-person or hybrid class in fall too, I mentioned this last time, that you have to look at the dates um, for by when you have to be vaccinated, if you have to come onto campus and upload your documentation. Uh, this is especially relevant to people who have been online only for fall one and maybe haven't been thinking about this. If you're already vaccinated, I would highly recommend that you go and hunt down that crazy little white cardboard piece of card or whatever that they gave all of us um, and find it and upload it and just make sure that you have all your information in place even if you are not registered for classes for fall two or you registered all online like I said enrollment numbers are not that high so you could end up in a situation where you may have registered for an online class and if it doesn't run your only other option is to take a class that's um in person or hybrid. And then if your vaccination records are not on file, you may not be able to get into that class in time. All right. So again, if you already, uh, you already got all your shots, you've got your little white uh, cardboard paper, or you've got your Excel show pass or whatever, just up upload it, right? Just make your life easy and upload the stuff as soon as possible. So you know you, you have flexibility. Um, what else is happening here? Uh, let me just see. The chapter 17, we're going to do one. I'm going to have you guys do one more example um, for the start of this class. And then, you know, by then, or honestly, by last class, you were already re ready to do all the homework. Um, please don't uh, wait until the last minute. Remember, I told you that Tuesday is going to be a Thursday schedule. So I'm, I'm worried for people who think they can leave the homework until Tuesday and then find out that they have all their Thursday classes and, and it may take up your whole day. So the homework is due at 6 p.m. on the 23rd this coming um, Tuesday. And obviously we we don't have class uh, on that Thursday because of Thanksgiving. Um, I repeat that the test is also opening on the same day that the chapter 17 homework is due and it will be open for a week. Um, if you're traveling or whatever for Thanksgiving and you know even if you come back only on Sunday you still have until um, Tuesday to do the quiz and the test but you know make sure that you provision enough time um, for yourself to do all of all of these things all right so that's the the uh, you know the the usual please register for classes so you don't end up classes get cancelled because you know, there's not enough people in them um, and fall two classes start on January the 3rd so so classes that are are not enough people will be cancelled sometime at the end of December 
Um, but you know that sounds long away, long, like far away, but it's really not that far away once we finish um, finals and stuff. Uh, you know, they're starting to look to see which classes are not going to run. I don't want people to end up in classes in fall two that are that have too low numbers and can't run because it impacts for some people how soon they can graduate. So if you know you want to take classes in fall two, just register for them now. Okay, um, make sure that everybody is, who you know is is registered. It's it's um, it's critical so that we can have all the classes that you need um, to graduate. Does anybody have questions about the scheduling, about um, registration, about the Tuesday, Thursday thing? Any questions? Professor, I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. Because it happened to me before that I signed up for classes for a short semester and uh, it was canceled like mm -hmm. a week before. Um, how can I check how many people registered for the classes I'm taking right now to make sure it's not going to get cancelled? Yeah, that's a good question because I, I know that I can see because I'm the faculty, I can see how many people in my class, but I'm not sure that that you as the student can see that because... I wish I knew in advance, you know. Yeah, you know, the only... The only um, the only thing that you can normally see is if the class is full and you can't get in or if the class is open. I think your your only option, I mean, I don't know which classes they are. We can talk more um, after class if you want to, but there is, um, I think your best bet is probably to contact, you know, someone in administration in the department that that class falls under to ask them if this class is in danger of being canceled. But I don't think you can see the numbers yourself. I think only the faculty can see it. I don't know because it's elective classes. It's not like related to technology or uh, or business or anything. So I don't know like who to contact. It's a public speaking class. Yeah, at the end of at the end of this class, you can you can show me because maybe um, I can help you to identify who. If you show me. What you registered for, I can I can see if I if there's a professor linked to it or not. Uh, then I can try and help you to figure out who in the department to speak to. Okay. I can do that. All Great. Right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Sure. No problem. Um, all right. And 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 just have backups ready, guys. You know, see, you're making a, a good point here. Just I know it's a pain in the neck, but if you're gonna do two classes in the six week session, maybe just maybe just have three classes. I'm not saying register for three classes. I'm just saying like have a third class as a backup plan if if one of your other two classes get um, canceled, all right? So you don't end up uh, a class behind for, for graduation. All right, so we move into um, an example here and this is exercise, uh, this is very small because I, I'm trying to fit it into the screen if people really, can't you know get the get to blackboard or, or can't get to the textbook if you look on zoom meeting materials for those of you who are on blackboard you download this additional class practice problem it's exercise 17.9 from the textbook so if you have the textbook around or you know you can get to the textbook through wiley it's the same question it's mitch you should be looking for mitch company and what I'm going to do here at the start of the class is I'm going to throw this back to you guys. Um, you know, I've done multiple cash flows with you now. We've, we've discussed things at length. Um, and I want you to try and see just how far you can, um, you can go with the cash flow. Um, I think there will be struggles and that's okay. But um, it's important for all of us that you guys have an opportunity in class to actually work through a cash flow and, um, and I can, you know, interject and, and help you. So for, for the first part of this class, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to give you guys, um, looking at, at the, the time, I think you need at least 33 zero. Uh, because of my accent, when I say 30, people think I'm saying 50, so 30, 30 minutes, right? Um, and so let's say by 11, 
eleven fifteen. Um, I'll check in with you. And what I'm going to do just to support you is to give you at least a check total for um, operating activities. And but I'm not going to give you that check total now. I'll give you that check total about fifteen minutes in to you know to the process. So, um, okay, the, the clock keeps going, so we'll call it 11.17. Um, yeah, okay, that, no, not 11.17, what am I talking about? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll calculate once I'm done talking. I, I don't know, I'm, I'm having a, a blank moment here. So this is the question, it's exercise 17.9. I'm sure it's gonna take people still another three to five minutes just to find the question, I guess. And, and so, um, you know, I'm aiming that we will be done with this whole process somewhere around 11.30 when we take the break. Um, does anybody have questions and a question about what we're doing? Like, I mean, let me actually just repeat. You are going to complete a full statement of cash flows using the indirect method. This uh, question is exercise 17.9 in the textbook. So you can either go to the textbook and get it, or you can download it uh, from chapter 17 materials on Blackboard, or you can just look at it on the screen. I'll leave it up on the screen. And you will have um, initially 30 minutes to get as far as possible. At the 15 minute mark, I'll give you a check total for um, operating activities and, and we'll continue. And if you have questions, you put them to me in the chat so that we don't disturb other people um, so that everyone can just have a fair shake at, at trying to answer this question. So now let me check with you. Do you guys have any questions for me um, about what we're about to do? Okay, so I'm going to leave you to it, please. You know, for the people who are, I don't know where everybody is, and you, you could be doing all kinds of things, but please do take the time to do this. There's a, there is a statement of cash flows on the exam. I want you to give yourself the best possible chance of getting good points. So, you know, don't uh, waste this time. At 11.03, I'll give you a check total for... Um, operating activities okay so i'm going to mute myself now you guys do the cash flow you have other examples of cash flows that i've done before so i'm not going to put an example up i'm just leaving the question up
I, I think uh, Jefferson and Scarlett and John, you just joined. Uh, the whole class is working on this example that's on the screen. You have to do a statement of cash flows uh, on the indirect method. So basically what we've been doing all along, it's the same as exercise 17.9 from the textbook. So um, you can either find it in your textbook or you can download it from the Zoom meeting materials on um, Blackboard by about, uh, 11.05, I'm going to give a check total for operating activities, but basically this time from now until about 11.30 is dedicated to you guys trying to do a statement of cash flows on your own. If you have questions about the statement of cash flows, you can type them to me in the chat so that we don't disturb the rest of the class, and that applies to everybody. Okay. Okay, thank you. Professor, bonds payable will be in the- You ask me, can you type in the chat, please, so we don't disturb the rest of the class. Thank you.
right is your check total and I'll put it in the um, chat also. The check total for operating activities is 133,000. So net cash provided by operating activities, you should have an amount of 133,000. So if you don't have that amount, try to find your mistake. If you can't find it, just keep moving, okay? Don't abandon the whole statement of cash flows now because you don't have the correct number. Just, just keep going to the other parts and you can come back to operating activities to see if you can fix it. If you have questions for me, put them in the chat.
So there's about 10 minutes left in the initial batch of time I gave you guys. Um, and I'll check in with you at about 11.21, and then we'll see about some more time if needed.
Okay, we're at 11.20. So what I'm gonna do is um, stop sharing the question just for a minute and pull up the first part of the solution, which is the operating activities and go over that so that if people did get stuck there, um, you have some guidance and then we can carry on with you working on the question afterwards. So I'm gonna stop the share. If you need the question, take a picture of it now. All right. Take a, a minute and take a picture of it. And I'll just be pulling up the solution here in a sec. Just give me a few minutes to pull up the solution because I have to get it off of Wiley. All right. Sorry, I will toggle between the question and the solution to just go over the operating activity section with you guys. And then um, after that, I'll still give some more time for people to fix their answers if need be and to continue with the, with the cash flow. All right. I just didn't want, uh, especially if people are struggling to get to the right thing. I don't want you to spin your wheels for, you know, a while. So. We have the comparative balance sheets of this company. They tell us that there's net income of 93,000. They give you the, the depreciation expense of 34,000. So, you know, they, they make life easy, but you can also see that it's the same 34,000 that was charged over here to accumulate the depreciation because the only depreciable asset is um, equipment and we didn't sell any equipment. So, so it's all just uh, depreciation added on. Um, that's for, uh, no equipment was sold during 2020, which means equipment was just bought. It seems that land was sold, but it was sold for, for its book value, which means the cash that you received is the same as the cost of the land. So there's no gains or losses in this um, in this question. Um, so let's go through, right? Net income, 93,000. That's what you should have on your sheet. Then the adjustments to reconcile net income to net cash provided by operating activities. The depreciation expense you pulled from uh, the question, 34,000. Um, accounts receivable, let's check, went up by 12,000. So an increase in accounts receivable is going to be a subtraction. So there's a subtraction. There's a decrease in inventory from 189 to 167. So a decrease in a current asset you add, and then accounts payable went down by 4,000. So that is going to be a subtraction. So these items together come up to 40,000. The 40,000 plus the 93,000 is 133,000. So this was a fairly or somewhat easier um, operating activity section because you didn't have to calculate depreciation expense yourself and you also didn't have any gains or losses, all right? So what I'm gonna do is give you the last, um, I'll, I'll leave this up for a second here, yeah, maybe uh, one minute or so, give you the remaining time until about 11.31. Um, that I think that makes a full 30 minutes or just over 30 minutes um, to finish the cash flow, and then we'll go over the solution. Okay, so if anybody needs to copy this down or uh, correct anything, I'm giving you 10 more seconds to, to do that. When we go over the rest of the stuff, you'll see this answer again in time. 
Okay, so I'm going back to the question and you now should be uh, basically almost finished or at least getting to the point where you're finishing um, financing and um, investing activities. All right, so let's go until 11.31, at which point we will take a break and after the break, I'll go over the full solution with you. I'm just, I'm stepping away from my desk for a second. I'll be back shortly.
Right, so we're at time. Um, I just want to remark that even though this question might have looked long, it's actually a fairly simple statement of cash flows compared to even some of the stuff we've done already. So um, if you found this to be relatively easy, that's why. If you're struggling with this um, question, then you really need to go back and revisit some of the examples we were doing because what you're being asked to do in this question is pretty straightforward. So we'll take a 10 minute break here until 11.41. And then when we come back, I'll go over the entire solution um, for this cash flow. For those who want to persevere during the break, if you still have um, if you still have something you need to finish, you can finish it. Or if you need to ask me questions, that's fine. But I'll explain the entire solution um, at the end of the break. Okay, so we're on break. Okay, the clock just changed to 32. So we're on break until 11.42. Professor, I'm just getting really confused with these questions because I don't understand why they give us the accumulated depreciation of like of equipment or we had in the homework accumulated depreciation of an asset mm -hmm. if we are not even going to use that. Because in some questions, they don't give you the depreciation expense. So um, there are questions where you or the scenarios where you have to actually um, calculate depreciation expense using the change in accumulated depreciation along with other information to do with assets that were sold like that's when it gets really difficult so um so first of all a balance sheet has to include accumulated depreciation maybe that's probably the first thing i should have said right you can't have a balance sheet with depreciable assets and not show the accumulated depreciation i mean that's it's just incomplete at that point but secondly sometimes depending on the question you actually do like they may not give you this line over here and then you would have to check to see what's the change in accumulated depreciation and that's your depreciation expense for the year i think we did that at least once together i could stand corrected i think there was a question where there was like a five thousand depreciation expense or something and we had to take it as the change in accumulated depreciation yeah this is when i get confused i'm, I'm not really good with uh, i don't really remember much of the material of the accumulated depreciation and how to do the entry for it it's um i mean in its simplest form it's the depreciation expense for the year the journal entry is a debit depreciation expense and credit accumulated depreciation. So let me just help you here for a second. Um, let me open the chapter 17 class workings because I, if I start writing in the wrong place, then I'm going to confuse everybody. The last question of homework, I got stuck on it for, for so long because I kept trying to add the accumulated depreciation to uh, the depreciation in the um, in the operating activity and I kept getting it wrong. And then I realized that I don't even need to add it. They gave me- a No, you, yeah, you don't, if they give you depreciation expense number, then you're done, right? But, um, yeah. you know, but if they don't, then it's not that you have to add accumulated depreciation. You have to, you have to add the change in the accumulated depreciation uh, account, you know, because the change in the account is the depreciation expense. So um, if you want, you know, I can just. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, and one question before you start. And then in the homework, they gave us an income statement with uh, cost of goods sold, operating expenses, um, mm -hmm. income tax expense. We didn't need to look at the, we didn't have to add uh, the cost of goods sold and operating expenses. Um, why <laughs> no because it's already included in net income and you don't you're adjusting for uh, operating expenses and and cost of goods sold that wasn't paid in cash by adjusting inventory and adjusting accounts payable so so from the uh, from the income statement we take only depreciation expense if they give it to us and any gains or losses if they give it to you if there's a gain or loss Mm -hmm. The depreciation expense and gain of losses. Mm -hmm. The rest mm -hmm. of the stuff we don't need. Mm -hmm. oh. 
I do well, see. Well, let me see. You uh, need net income, obviously. You need depreciation expense. If there's amortization expense, you need that. Although I don't see that coming up in in on in this textbook. Um, and then you would need gains and or losses if you're talking specifically about what you need for operating activities. That's what you need. Mm -hmm. I don't remember if I used it. Let me let me let me go to the question. Otherwise, we're just going to be speculating because yeah. I can't I can't remember uh, what the fact pattern was. So I don't want to tell you something that. But the questions we did in class now, I got it right. And yeah. So yeah, what? Which was it? This problem seventeen point nine. Yeah, the last one. Okay. So here yeah, goes your, yeah, so this is, so this is similar to the question we had that I did with you, uh, yes, not yesterday, sorry, I was with you guys on Tuesday. Remember that last question that I did with you? There was also an income statement. Um, that's the last question in the, in the chapter 17 um, notes. Mm -hmm. Do you, you remember it? I just want to show you quickly. Uh, let me find it uh, because it's, it's just important to see that these questions actually are similar to each other even though it feels like everything is just crazy it's actually not this one Roethlisberger yeah <clears throat> okay no, was, no it wasn't Roethlisberger sorry sorry number six my bad number six Zambran uh, uh, remember it had a depreciation expense and it also had a loss it's the same same setup all right you see that yeah, yeah oh, see okay that. Yeah, so um, where was I? Okay, so yeah, you will need, yes, your net income, you'll need your depreciation expense, and you'll need your loss on disposal. Everything else you should ignore, like I found people like trying to put income taxes in, because remember, net income includes everything already, and then you just have to decide what you want to adjust for. Don't start adding, you know, and by you, I mean all of us, like don't, let's not start adding back things that don't need to be adjusted for. You stick with your three adjustments, add back the non-cash expenses like depreciation expense and amortization expense, you know, add the loss or deduct the gain. And then anything else that is sitting here like cost of goods sold or operating expenses, all the cash impacts of those things that we need to adjust for will be dealt with when you do the changes in the current assets and the current liabilities. All of them. Sorry, can you repeat again? So we, yeah. I'm taking the the loss because I was looking at my answer to make sure. Yeah, it's fine. You so you add back the depreciation expense, the income, right? The, from the income statement, I need to take only the depreciation expense and the last. The rest I'm not taking because why? Because <laughs> you are going to anything else that actually impacts net income related to you know other expenses and and cost of goods sold is dealt with through your adjustment of the current assets and the current liabilities it it will it will resolve itself because when you adjust for accounts receivable right this increase in accounts receivable then you are adjusting for any revenue that wasn't received in cash when you adjust this inventory change, you are adjusting for any cost of goods sold that wasn't paid in cash, okay? When you adjust prepaid expenses over here for this increase, you're adjusting for any expenses over here that weren't paid in cash. When you adjust accounts payable, right? Same idea, adjusting for anything that uh, over here still also in operating expenses that wasn't paid for in cash. And finally, the accrued expenses payable, same idea. You're adjusting for maybe if there's income tax or other expenses that weren't paid for in cash. So you would be double counting if you try to adjust, if you try to do anything other than taking depreciation expense and the loss or the gain that you see in an income statement and your net income number that you need, stop. That's it, because anything else is gonna is going to be taken care of through adjusting current assets and current liabilities. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's just like so much. <laughs> yeah. Remember what I said about ca cash flows. It's it's the hard, it's one of the hardest topics um to yeah. to cover. Mm -hmm. It's like you need to understand a lot. Yeah, yeah or you, I mean, you can just go like by the- um, Like changing, it's not, every question is different. It's like- Yeah, different and that's the, that's the, um, and that's also what makes it hard because often people, and by people, I mean, people in general, not you, um, often people try to just 
you know, almost like memorize that if the question looks like this, then this is what I do. But with statement of cash flows, the information is always presented in, in different ways. So you actually have to, in your mind, you can't just say, oh, I recognize this question, so now I'm going to do this. You're going to say, what do I have to do to create a statement of cash flows? And so it starts with net income, make your three adjustments, right? The three types of adjustments that you have to make and move on. Um, so you just kind of have to stick to the script. Otherwise, you can get really lost in the weeds of the stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, Professor, can you show me a, a, an example now of uh, like how do you do a general entry of uh, the depreciation? Yeah, yeah. I was going to, let me see, I was going to show it of, of this thing, right? So um, so the, end, the, the balance of a year at the end of 2021 is 32,000. So that's not the right thing, sorry. So uh, accumulated depreciation is a contra asset. So the, the balance is on the credit side, right? So the beginning balance for 2022 is the same um, as the ending balance for 2021. So it's gonna be 32,000. And then all I'm saying is at this point, nothing was sold. So they, if, if an asset has, had been sold, then you would have put any uh, depreciation, accumulated depreciation related to that asset on the side. There's nothing that was sold. So you can safely say that now your ending balance, I just, I'm just going to show you how this looks, right? So the ending balance, uh, 2022, they give it to you as um, 66,000, right? So then the, the, the journal entry is whatever this difference is over here, right? And we already uh, saw that it's going to be 34000 that you have to put in extra. So this is the depreciation expense for the year. And the way that journal entry looks, which is really your question, I think, um, is that you debit depreciation expense for 34,000, I'll fix the E over there in a minute, and you credit accumulated depreciation. So they're connected, right? And, and you know, other than just the fact that a balance sheet needs to show accumulated depreciation, you should also remember that there's a relationship <clears throat> between them, between these two accounts. And so sometimes if you, like if you're not given the depreciation expense number, for the year, you can actually um, use this setup that I'm giving you here to, to calculate it. Mm -hmm. When do you debit accumulated appreciation? When you sell an asset. When you sell, can you show an example of uh, selling an asset? I think it's in the homework, let me see. Yeah, it's here. Okay, so let me, let me um, you know, we're starting back up people should be back from break. The, the question, and this is important for everybody, this is why I'm just stopping to make sure that people are actually paying attention and not just thinking that this is a question that you're asking. Um, I can show you, although although this, this is the last question on the homework, guys, for anybody who just joined, although this question already gives you the depreciation expense, right, over here, I can show you that if the, I can show you how to calculate it if the question did not give you depreciation expense is that that is what you're asking me right but there's also a sale of an mm -hmm. asset okay yeah that's what I'm so I'm currently looking for uh, for the rest of the class I'll go over the solution for for the additional problem that we just did before the break in a, in a second but tune in here um because this this question relates to uh, you know part of the segment of cash flows and this could come up for you the question is and I'll I'll type you know, the type it over here. How do we calculate, right? Depreciation expense for the year if we aren't given the number, right? From, from, from the income statement. Because again, this does happen. Um, <clears throat> this does happen sometimes. In, in certain questions. So uh, this is coming from problem 17, 
5.9, which is uh, the homework question. And again, the problem does give you the depreciation expense. You don't actually have to calculate it yourself, but I'm trying to show you how it would work if you weren't given. This number, okay? So assume we weren't given the depreciation expense number. So how do you do it? <clears throat> just be systematic, right? With a lot of the stuff, just be systematic. Ask yourself, what's the beginning balance of accumulated depreciation? What's the ending balance of accumulated depreciation? Was there any sale of an asset during the year, right? That I have to take into consideration. And then, you know, the difference between all those numbers is going to give me a depreciation expense number. So going back to the homework question, I have uh, 52,900 for accumulated depreciation at the end of 2021 and 47,800 end of 2022. So obviously we know that something that's the ending balance in 2021 is the beginning balance in 2022, all right? So what I'm gonna do here is write beginning, I'm just abbreviating beginning balance 2022. And <clears throat> I wanna make sure I'm getting this right. 52,900, 52,900, all right? Um, I know that my ending balance, so I can actually, you know, populate what I know and try to calculate. The thing that we're trying to find is the depreciation expense. We, we don't know what this number is and we're trying to find it, okay? The ending balance for 2022, you pick up off of the um, balance sheet, it's 47,800. So 47,800, right. Now, if there was no sale during the year, you would just be able to, um, you know, use these two numbers, but you can already see something is wrong because how could we have less depreciation at the end of the year than what we started with, right? That must mean that something was sold. So there's a sale of some sort. A sale is, is a debit because when you dispose of the asset, this is just part of, of the rules of um, disposals, the credit balance on accumulated depreciation has to be debited because you are getting rid of the asset. So what was sold? If you look at the question, you see that old plant assets with an original cost of 48,800 and accumulated depreciation of 38,300 was sold for 3,000 cash. So this 38,300 is the accumulated depreciation that needs to be subtracted because the asset no longer exists, right, on our books. So we know that that's related to the sale. So that information is given, this is given, and this is given. So we solve now for depreciation expense. And the way we're gonna do that is we're going to say, okay, we started with 52,900, we subtracted, or we, you know, we uh, got rid of 38,300, but we still have to end on 47,800. So what's the math? You guys do the math. What is depreciation expense? Isn't it 14,600? 14,600, okay. We have a 14,600 going once. Let's see, I'm gonna go back and make sure that I know what it should be. Mm -hmm. Okay, anybody else? That's that number is uh, Michelle. That number is not correct. Okay, so I'm I'm looking for other numbers. Forty three four hundred. I'm gonna say no. What number do we need to add to fifty two thousand nine hundred so that if we 
subtract this 38,300, we still get to 47,800. So maybe if we did, um, if we did it in a, a line, I don't know if, if that makes any difference. 52,900 plus. 32,200. Yes. So tell okay, us how sorry. you Sorry, incomplete. I didn't finish. <laughs> So what so what what do you want to tell me? Okay, so basically what I did was I subtracted 50 52,900 into 38,300. Okay. And then from that I saw that I got 14,600. So then I know that I'm missing the depreciation expense and I have the ending balance of 47,800. Mm -hmm. So from that, I will subtract um, the 14,600. And then that's when I got the- You got 33? 33,200. That's the answer. Which is the same number that's given on the question, but mm -hmm. to seize a question, how do we calculate depreciation? Which is a, a very important question. How do we calculate depreciation expense if we don't, um, have the number given to us. So let me see if I can manipulate the math here. So you're saying take 52,900, subtract 38,300, right? That's giving you 44, I mean, 14,600. And then that's still not the answer, obviously. So then then what did you do? You said uh, 47,800 minus 14,600, right? right? Mm -hmm. right. Okay. So we kind of have to do like almost like a side... A side, a side down. calculation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's what it would be if you just subtracted it, but you still have to get to 47,800. So then you have to say 47,800 minus the difference in these two numbers. So you still get to 33,200. I think there's a shorter way to do it. My brain is, is not allowing me to think of it. But um, either way, however you get there, the, oh, sorry, I, I deleted something, so then it jumped to 47,800. So uh, 33,200. Okay, sorry, Maya, uh, yeah, your internet's kicking you out. So uh, C, it was your original question. Are you good? Um, yeah, it's a complicated <laughs> um, calculation. But <laughs> yeah, but remember, I'm gonna highlight all the numbers that are given. All okay. these numbers are given to you and then you in the question and you just have to calculate depreciation expense so that your T account is, is balancing to the right ending balance. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm not saying that it's, that, it's that, that necessarily makes it easier. I'm just saying that you, you're basically manipulating numbers as opposed to, you just need to know where each number goes as opposed to, you know, coming up with some crazy way of doing this. It's going to be the same thing every time. So, am I supposed to expect something like this in the test? <laughs> you should expect anything because we've done we've done myriad uh, calculations and stuff. Um, ex expect anything. What I will say is, don't get stuck in the weeds. Um, meaning that you still need to be able to do a statement of cash flows, and if you you know, if you get the depreciation expense number correct, that's great, but that's not going to be, you know, 90% of, um, of, the, of the test. I honestly can't remember if the, the question I put on the test has some extra steps or not, so I'm not trying to be obtuse, but I also can't tell you, I mean, I'm already telling you guys you're getting a cash flow, I can't also now tell you what cash flow you're getting. I think that's not, you know, fair from a, from a pedagogical perspective. So, expect that the material will be tested, whether it's going to be tested, you know, at this level. You, sh you if you, you know, you guys should expect anything. I went over it so realistically it could come in. Yeah, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let me, uh, forgive yes. me, uh, I have to cut us off oh, on that. Okay. So that yeah, I, I can ask you uh you said uh, you might send us uh today uh as examples for uh questions yeah i said if i yeah i said if i have if i have time i'm i'm having uh, multiple meetings and stuff over the past week so i need to see how i can squeeze that in it might only be late tonight if i can squeeze it in because as soon as i'm done yeah for office hours and after office hours i have meetings back to back until six o'clock this afternoon so just bear with me, mm -hmm. bear with me. 
Okay, thank right. you so much. So going on with this cash flow that we were actually working on before, right? So 133,000 is the operating activities. Then, sorry, let me just open up the whole thing so that it's, it's, it's not gonna work for me. Okay, then. Um, so yeah, the sale of the land, uh, I had already said, right? That land was sold at book value. Book value is the same as cost because land isn't depreciated. So obviously this is a $20,000 difference and it's cash coming in at 20,000, right? Equipment was purchased. It says that no equipment was sold. So you have to assume that $60,000 of equipment uh, was purchased during the year. That's a minus because you are you know, taking money out of your pocket to buy that equipment. So it's net cash used by investing activities of $40,000. Coming to cash flows from financing activities, you've got the issuance of common stock. When we look at the question, it says common stock was issued at par for 42,000 cash. 42,000 is also the difference between these two numbers. So cash comes in from the issuance of the common stock. Payment of cash dividends, it was given to you, right? 39,000 cash dividends were declared and paid. That's a minus. And then the question also tells you that the bonds were redeemed for cash. So that's a minus here, here. And I mean, you can see the bonds went down. So bonds went down and cash went down because you paid cash uh, to redeem those bonds. So these uh, three numbers together also end up in a negative number, net cash used by financing activities, negative 47,000. So now we remember that um, what we're trying to explain is this change in cash for the year. And we also need to end on 68,000. So now we come to the, sorry, this is not the right thing, the last, um, the last part of the statement of cash flows, you say 133,000 minus 40,000 minus 47,000 gives you that change of 46,000 that uh, positive, right? That we saw on the balance sheet. And then to that, you add the cash at the beginning of the year. Where's that coming from, right? It's the ending 2021 cash is the beginning 2022 cash. And then you uh, have cash at the end of the period of 68,000. And so then you know that you're balancing. So like I said, uh, I didn't give you a very hard example to do on your own because I didn't want people to become completely flustered. But if you were already having difficulty with this question, it means that you need a lot more practice, okay? Because this question didn't even have a gain or a loss. Um, it, you know, it was, it, it, was, it was fairly basic stuff going on here. Um, so make sure that you can at least handle a question like this and you will probably need to go back and look at some of the other examples that we did that were even more involved than this question. So the floor is open for the next uh, two minutes or so. I'm, I'm leaving this up in case people need to correct their work or take down the answer, but the floor is open if you have uh, questions about um, this practice problem. Professor, mm. I have a question, not about that, but in the homework, the question that we just did together, they say uh, the old plant asset was sold for 2,500, but then they give us in the um, income statement, the loss on disposal of plant asset. Mm -hmm. it, it, they give us a different number. Yeah, but it can be different because the what it was sold for is the cash that you received. The loss is the difference between the cash and the book value. So oh, that makes yeah. sense. Mm -hmm. I did do it and I see the same so number. The cash number goes into investing activities and the loss number goes into operating activities, and they are rarely the same number. Okay. Yes. Okay, perfect. Other Thank questions, you. folks? Anything else? All right, so that uh, concludes um, statement of cash flows, right? We can wipe the sweat or blood sweat off of our brows, but that does not conclude your work. Your homework again is due on Tuesday and um, please do it. 
That's all I can say. This thing will only be, uh, you know, this beast will only be tamed by you actually uh, attacking it. Otherwise, um, you're going to have a significant amount of points on the test will be lost if you don't know how to do a statement of cash flows. It's, it's just, a, that's just the reality of it. Um, before I move to talk a little bit about uh, chapter 18, I just want to make sure that I'm not missing any people who are actually here today uh, on the attendance. I'm only calling out people who I don't see. So please don't tell me afterwards that you didn't hear your name, okay? Is Michaela here? Natasha? Chahomi? So light, light attendance today. Lance? Andrew? Margaret and Shimon. Okay, so those folks are not here. All right. Uh, professor, I kind of missed first few names. Did you call mine too? No, I just said I'm only calling people. Oh, you missed the names. I'm only, you're here. I know you're here. I checked you, but I'm only calling people that, that are not here. So you're no. good. You're good. I'm, I'm Shafar. I know. <laughs> I know. Okay. <laughs> I thought you called some other name. No, okay. I called uh, Shimon, uh, but you are, yeah, so don't worry. I saw you already. I took attendance a few times already while we've been going. <laughs> don't worry. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks for the, the joke. <laughs> um, all right. So, chapter 18. Um, let me see uh, if I can go back to course resources and I will go to the textbook just to show you what it looks like, but then we'll use the, the notes. Um, in the meantime, while I'm pulling up the textbook, if you do want to follow the notes that, I'm, that I gave you guys, it's up on Zoom meeting materials, chapter 18. Um, it's right there and also obviously the spreadsheet, which is currently blank. <clears throat> Right, so, so let's go back to it. Okay, so this chapter 18 is called uh, Financial Analysis or the Big Picture. Basically, what's happening in this chapter is that we, now that we've been exposed to every, you know, financial statement, um, we are going to use that knowledge about what is in those financial statements and apply um, a series, really our focus is on applying a series of ratios or formulas to the numbers in the statement to try and see how the company is doing, okay? So, you know, we've now done the journal entries, we've We've done all the, you know, ledgers and stuff. We've produced financial statements. But yes, you can see overall that maybe the revenue number is bigger this year than last year, whatever the case may be. But what about the question of, you know, how is, um, let's say, how is Target doing versus Walmart? If you just look at revenue numbers, it may not be uh, easy to see which company is actually doing better if you just look at profit. But if you start using... Um, ratios or formulas that help to standardize uh, the, the numbers and, and show, us, um, show us ways in which we can compare one company to another, then we um, may end up finding you know, some valuable ways to assess um, investments or assess companies and see whether we want to actually put our money into them, whether it is as a, a bank, giving a loan or an investor um, actually putting money into the stocks of the company. Over here is, you know, famous investor Warren Buffett um, is been known for many years to, they call him the Oracle of Omaha to be really good at, um, at investing. And he has a company called Berkshire Hathaway that um, 
you know, invests in a lot of different uh, companies and, and often in company, always talks about investing in, in what you know. And he does what we call value investing, um, trying to find basically stocks that are underpriced based on what he thinks they should be worth and then investing in them and, and holding them, waiting for um, stock price increases. So, um, you know, he's, he's a known, uh, you know, good, well, good is probably an understatement of uh, an excellent investor and um, why he is on the cover, I guess, of, of, of this chapter is that a lot of the analysis that we're going to be doing in this chapter is, you know, what financial analysts and other people use to determine basically the health of the businesses that they are thinking about investing in. So, you know, if if you, um, I'll give you an example, although it's it's very basic and it probably is, it's probably more basic than, than um, what we'll be doing, but I'll just give you an example. So I'm on Robinhood. I'm sure you guys are from, I have other trading accounts also, but Robinhood is like a, an online app that you can trade through. You can buy and sell stocks. There's no brokerage fees, whatever. I mean, Robinhood has had its share of, of scandals and ethical concerns and so on about what it actually does with our money um, that we have you know, on deposit with them. But nevertheless, I'm still using the app because it's very convenient and, and um, you know, I like it. So in Robinhood, they also um, from time to time will tell you that there may be an opportunity to invest in a company that is having what we call an IPO, an initial public offering. Um, so the company is um, going to issue shares to the public for the first time, right? And um, so, of course, I'm always intrigued to see who's going to market. Um, I feel like I missed out on a few opportunities when I was probably half asleep from having a kid or something. But uh, one of the companies that I wish I had invested in was Beyond Meat, but um, that ship has sailed for me. But so I'm, I'm like always checking up to see what's happening. So I think I mentioned this company before because we're talking about the deliciousness of the food, but I saw that Sweet Green, which is a company that makes salads, um, was gonna ha is having an IPO. And um, so now, Shafak, do you wanna say something? Yeah, I went today, right? Sorry, I didn't hear you. I went IPO today, right? Yeah, yeah, I think it was today. But um, I, I haven't even looked to see, I, I, should, I should check here if what happened, because I'll tell you what happened in the late hours of last night while I was trying it's to see. It's $28, it started with 28 Yeah, no, yeah, that was what they, what, that's what the prospectus said, that the starting price was gonna be $28. So, it's, so you know, um, so $28 for one stock, guys, for those who, you know, may not be fully following what we're, talking about um i haven't seen it going public yet shafak it may it may have gone today already but it's not updating on my phone here anyway so uh, this, sorry no, the, no, this no, they're no. gonna start it at 12 but it didn't start yet ah okay so anyway so i'm looking at sweet green and i'm thinking okay 28 bucks i'm like okay maybe i'll throw Okay, I'm, I'll, I'll look at what you just said, John, in a second, because I, otherwise I'm going to lose my train of thought. But I was thinking, okay, I'm, I'm debating now, should I go into this or not? But then I'm like, oh, 28 bucks, like maybe I should just throw a few bucks at this thing. Then I'm like, wait, 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 I know better than this, right? I'm, I'm a finance person and I'm an accountant. So I looked at the prospectus, which is this humongous document that they send with like all the information, including financial information. And then, and so this is to give you guys an idea of, of why we do this financial statement analysis so then i started like running some numbers uh, in my mind uh, profitability and so on of, of what i would be looking for for a company that i'm investing in and i was surprised to see and i'm not sure that i can pull up um you know that i can pull up uh, robin hood on it's always in the app i'm not sure that i can pull it up um on my computer here to show you guys the prospectus I guess I can log in, but I don't even know if I still have access to the prospectus. But just to, to finish the discussion, um, I realized then that uh, they were, they're making losses 
And I was surprised that, um, I mean, they, their profitability ratios and stuff are not as good as I would have hoped. And I thought, okay, maybe it's, maybe it's because I was just uh, probably assuming that because I like the, the food, they're doing great. But it, yeah, it, it, was just, it was just surprising to me um, that, that they, they're going public, their revenue has actually gone down um, year over year. And um, yeah, it's, and that, that I was about to, I guess, throw money at it. And, and I'm not saying that one shouldn't, but I was about to throw money at the, at the, um, at the IPO without looking fully at the, you know, at the financial statements to see how they were actually doing. So what's the point of all of this? I'm just trying to see if I can, if I can find, I mean, I was like literally looking at the prospectus last night, but now for some reason, I can't see it. Just bear with me for a second. Yeah, you know, I don't know why, but I, I actually, I was hoping to show you guys the prospectus, but for those who are interested in, in investing and if you have invested or you're going to in, invest, um, and I, I'm not familiar with uh, MTEX and, and I think someone else said Lucid, we can talk about it at the end of class, but what's, what, what's the point of all of this? I'm saying that, you know, when we look at companies, like you say, oh, I've got some excess cash, so I want to invest in, Apple, or I want to invest in Sweet Green, or you know, there's some other company that's going public um, that I'm interested in. So you know, I'm just I'm gonna th throw some money at the company. Um, it, it probably would benefit you to at least go through some basic you know calculations, and and I'll you know I'll show you, and I'm just gonna go down a little bit here um, to the point where we'll actually start our yeah, our ratios. It would it would definitely benefit all of us before we just throw money at things and say, oh, I think the stock is going to go up or whatever. To at least look at the financials: is the company profitable? Is there actually growth in revenue? Um, you know, are they making losses or not? Do they have enough uh, assets to cover their liabilities and so on and so forth? Now, of course, company situations can change. I'm not saying that Sweet Green is is not going to do well. There might be a lot of buzz. The stock price could go up. But for me personally, I just felt a little bit weird last night to say, oh, I'm going to invest in a company that is making salads, um, you know, which is great. But, you know, even during the time of, I guess, uh, after COVID, um, you know, they it seems like they haven't really picked up that much with the orders and, and that may just be because people aren't back at work, but I couldn't really understand, you know, how their business model was going to change to accommodate for that. So that's the story. I I appreciate the, the people who are um who are commenting here. Um let me see. M Met X, I don't I'm not familiar with that uh, buying stock with Lucid. Uh, no idea, but talk to me at the end of class. <laughs> Maybe I do know what it is. It's it's just not ringing a bell right now. Shafak, go ahead. Shafak, you can talk. Uh, yeah, professor, I wanted to know, like, how you how do you find out if the company is good enough to invest or not? That's a great question. <laughs> it's almost impossible to give you a formula for what. Uh, for how to figure that out because I'm saying that sweet green is not profitable. So that gave me pause for thought. I'm like, I don't know if I want to put money into this thing, but look at Tesla. They weren't profitable for years, right? But because their technology was so incredible, people were betting on the revenue flowing in eventually, right? And so they started buying, um, buying stocks left and right. Um, 
you know, it's it's a combination of, of macroeconomic factors, like where is the, you know, my, my sister's an equity analyst, and I mean, I don't want to bore the people who don't care about stocks, but uh, I've said this before, right, and I'll say it again, for people like us, and I'm making a, a big statement here, potentially immigrants, I'm also an immigrant, people who didn't necessarily come from a lot of money, people who are trying to hustle and make something of themselves, don't, don't exclude uh, the possibility of investing in stocks, whether it's exchange traded funds or actual individual stocks as part of your building of wealth, okay? Um, often we kind of just automatically exclude ourselves from that because that's the business of people on Wall Street or whatever. That's where a lot of wealth is made. I think the S&P 500 has returned almost 33 0% this year. It's rare that you will find an investment that's going to give you back. So if you had just invested in an index fund that tracks the market, you don't even have to pick a stock. You just invest in the S&P 500 index ETF. You, you're returning close to 30 percent for the year okay that's a massive return so Shafak to your to your point how do you decide you have to be you have to set aside a lot of time to to read up on the stuff you may subscribe to um you know, there are things uh, like Morningstar or The Motley Fool or other types of uh, places that will give actual research on the stocks because we don't all have time to sit and do the research. You also want to look at the macro economy. I mean, you don't want to invest, obviously, in stocks that where you can see that the technology is changing and, you know, that that's not where the world is going. Um, some, of the, some of the stuff that's really hot now, it's very difficult to find any type of fundamental information on what's going on with it like cryptos right cryptos crypto mining crypto um investing it's it's hard to know because every day there's a new meme coin and whatever coming out you kind of really have to dig deep you may even have to listen to people who are you know there's a podcast called bankless i think where they have people coming in that actually talk about you know cryptos and it's not just like some hype person it's actual people who know you know what's happening so it's a combination of things if, if we have to speak about this theoretically you start at the macro level and you look at economic trends, you look at, you know, what's happening in the country, what's happening in the world, you know, and 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 which of those factors impact the, the investment that you are thinking about making. Um, you know, so if you take Sweet Green as an example, where are they located? Are they predominantly in places where people have to be working in offices? And, and that's, you know, how they sell to a lot of people that are in offices. If everyone's working from home, what does that mean for their model? How are they adapting? And so on. They, I mean, there's more macroeconomic factors than just that, like the price of food is going up, inflation, blah, blah, blah. Then you come to the company itself and you start using things like some of these tools that we're looking at. You look at the changes in the, especially revenue is an important thing, the growth in revenue, earnings per share numbers, which we'll also calculate. Um, and you build a trend, right? You have to look at the number of years. You can't just look at one year. You sometimes have to look at two or more years to try and see if the situation is improving. And then normally on these if there's, you know, uh, earnings call or whatever, the company will talk about their plans for the future and forecast some of their numbers and you can kind of see whether um, things are getting better. And then, I mean, you, you, you don't invest money that you can't afford to to part with if things don't go your way, right? If you had invested recently in Facebook before the whistleblower thing, there's been a massive drop in the in the price of Facebook because they, they there was a huge there's a huge scandal now because of this whistleblower thing. So um, so you also have to factor in that there could be unexpected um, events that could cause your investment, you know, to to suffer. I guess it's the best way to say it. But um, but the the you know the worst thing you can do is let your gut or your emotions rule your investment <laughs> decisions you want to base it on um, actual like trying to find actual data and if you really are concerned about investing in a particular stock then I would say rather look at an exchange traded fund that is in that uh, you know industry so if you're like eh, I don't know if I want to invest in a particular crypto okay fine but I think there's a crypto ETF that was created recently so maybe you want to put your money into that because then that's a combination of a basket of, of cryptos and I'm not trying to give investment advice I, I just want to be clear I have to give this disclaimer since this is being recorded what I am saying is 
do do your research or pay someone to do the research for you. But don't just let uh, you know Andrea Francis say, "Oh, sweet green," and all your years, sweet green, and then you go buy the stocks and you didn't even open the prospectus or anything to to check to see how the company is doing. How's how's that for um, Shafak for your question? Is is do you have a follow up or are we good on that? Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, I understand. Yeah, and I know, I mean, I, I read you guys' bios, like, obviously some time back, but I know that you trade, so um, I'm sure you have your own methodology, but yeah, for the rest of us, or for the people who are not as, um, you know, as in tune with the stock market on a day-to-day -day basis, you just want to be careful not to just run in the direction of, of you know, whatever the latest trend is, because um, you do need to make sure that it actually makes sense for, um, you know, some type of long-term investment uh, and not necessarily day, day trading. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, uh, Sam is also talking about looking at the data about the company when it was founded, who are the employees. Uh, okay, so Lucid is making electric cars. That's uh, that's good. Uh, Tesla's competitor. So yeah, it takes some it takes some research. And if you don't have time to do that research, then then you're probably better off just investing in a a stock that's uh, or an ETF or something that's tracking the market and let somebody else do the work for you, all right? Um, that's the smart play if you like, I'm not gonna be able to follow this company you know, all the time to see what they're doing. All right, so again, why do we care? Because we're gonna be analyzing financial statements and you can use some of this information uh, you know, that we're learning to actually look at your Stocks, yeah. Um, Sam is saying also, you know, you can join groups of people. There's a lot of Reddits out there about investing. I mean, you also have to be careful with the Reddits. You know, there's can also just be people trying to create hype for what you call pump, pump and dump schemes, where they try to pump up the price of a stock to hype it up, and then they, you know, run ahead of the market and and sell the stock before everybody else and and take profits. So. Just be aware, especially during COVID times, a lot of people were home and they started, you know, dabbling in the stock market to try and make some extra money. And the stock market has obviously been returning quite healthily during this time. But there are some people who are actually not qualified to, you know, be telling anybody anything. But now because they made a few bucks recently, they are, you know, acting like they know everything on um on investment forums. Uh, so that's why I err on the side of, of, you know, also looking at the professionals and not just, you know, some somebody who I don't know. Um, yeah, yes, at AMC and GameStop were exactly that, pump and dump. Um, I mean, there were other reasons also, uh, the, the Reddit activists or whatever were trying to harm hedge funds, that, that was part of it as well. All right. So what's happening in chapter 18 for the little bit of time that we have left, um, analyzing financial statements, we're going to look at three big areas. Uh, there are other ways that you can analyze financial statements, but, the, but we're gonna focus on ratio analysis and the ratio analysis falls into three big topics, liquidity, profitability, and solvency. So let's take, take them and, and, and look at what the definitions are. Liquidity is about the ability of the company to pay obligations as they come due. Sometimes, uh, you know, the way they ask it is how liquid is the company, meaning how much cash do they have available to settle the debts that are coming due, right? So short-term creditors are concerned with this example. If a bank gives you a short-term note, like a three-month note, or, you know, if you have accounts payable, your, um, your suppliers or whatever are concerned that you have enough cash or other current assets um, to cover your current liabilities. And so, you know, the this is the the liquidity piece. And within this uh, liquidity heading, we're going to have a number of ratios that we can use to test to see, right, how, um, how able the company is to meet its obligations. Uh, profitability is, um, you know, this was what I was looking at when I was looking at Sweet Green and thinking about this IPO that was happening. Um, 
I was saying, you know, how profitable is the company and is there actually an increase in their profitability over time? Because normally uh, stock prices are an indication of um, how investors view the company's ability to generate profits, you know, moving forward amongst other things. But I mean, it's especially about that, like how much revenue do they think the company will generate? So if the company is not profitable um, already, then, you know, that gives you a little bit pause for thought, like how are they going to get out of this lack of profitability and then still, uh, you know, make growth in, in profit. So profitability is all about how much net income did they make, you know, how um, how much are they returning, like how much am I getting back on any of, of my investment, those types of questions, earnings per share and so on. And then solvency um, is, uh, something's wrong here. I don't know why this is, uh, this shouldn't be profitability and um, solvency. I'll, I'll fix this and, and put the thing back up again. Uh, solvency is the, the company's, uh, is about the company's ability to survive over the, a long period of time. That's correct, right? So, so profitability, I mean, it's obvious, right? The company's ability to generate profits, right? No that's that's not really uh, groundbreaking information, but I'm not sure they must it must have just been a bug that crept in here um, to join those two together. So you know the, the I guess to some extent uh, the profitability does uh, say something about the company's ability to to survive over a long period of time. Yeah, I guess to some extent maybe that's why they were together. But it's but in its simplest form, it's like how is the company even making net income or is it all net losses or what? Um, so can you survive over time? Solvency, if you're insolvent, it means that your liabilities are greater than your assets. Right. So with solvency, it's you're gonna see when we do the ratios, it's a lot of like total debt to total assets. What's the you know, what's the percentage of debt to assets? Um, are we able to pay interest? Things like that. So if you think about this in your own life, right? Um, maybe you don't yet own a property or anything, but you do have cash in the bank, maybe you have some stocks, but you also have student loans, you have a credit card, you know, you have maybe other types of debt you owe, you know, your sister 50 bucks or whatever. So if you add up all the debt that you have and you and you add up all the assets that you have, if you take the debt as a percentage of the assets, that tells you, you, you know, how solvent you are. And hopefully you have less debt, right, than, than the assets. So again, when we look at um, these ratios, we're going to analyze the companies under these three major headings and use the ratios that fall um, under the headings as an indication of how the company is doing. Right. Any questions on, on these three categories before I move on and talk a little bit about how we're going to do this? All right. So, of course, when we do the financial statement analysis, we can just calculate one number. And for some of our examples, we will just calculate a ratio so that you can get used to using um, the formula. But what's most helpful or useful with financial statement analysis is if you actually compare the company to itself. So you can calculate the ratio for 2021 and then compare it to the same ratio for 2020 to see if there's been an improvement or deterioration or maybe the company is just stable, right? So uh, in some of the questions, we will be asked to do calculations for at least two years and then to comment on, you know, how the, how the company is doing. And that's really what we care about. When I was looking at the, the Sweet Green Prospectus, I looked at the numbers um, for, I think it was the end of 2020 or, or something. And then I started looking back. I think they presented like four or five years. I started looking back to see, you know, how, how, is the, how was the company doing before the pandemic? And, you know, what's, what's been happening, you know, up to now to, to give myself an idea of what we call intra company, right? Intra company within the company, comparing the results of the company to itself last year versus this year, you know, five years ago versus now and so on. Um, 
and that's helpful. That gives you a lot of information about whether the company is is a good. We're talking about investments, right? Whether it's a good investment, is it is are these numbers constantly improving? Um, <clears throat> And then you can also look at industry averages, absolutely, right? Uh, sometimes, um, you know, the company can be in a very particular type of industry and you want to actually look, maybe there's not that much information. Maybe it's even the first year or first two years that the company's uh, around or maybe the company's ratio is, is just so different and you want to see, okay, so, so what does the industry usually do? And so when you're analyzing investments, often um, you will try and see about industry averages on some of these, uh, some of these ratios. In fact, um, they are this is more for private companies but they are they are and it does exist for public companies but i'm saying if you have a, a private company that you own or whatever and you are calculating your own uh, ratios they are actually services that provide industry averages um, for private companies as well and then you have inter-company basis so intercompany you're looking at you know the, your company in relation to another company within the same type of business or within the same industry so you know if i'm looking at sweet green um i'm trying to think now who who could i compare sweet green to just salad maybe i don't know it, it might not be at the same price point but i'm going to look at like other salad uh, companies i'm going to look at other uh uh, what do you call it? Um, not fast food, but like quick food um, chains or whatever to see what they're doing um, and so on. I think there's an example in the textbook that compares Target to Walmart. They're kind of in the same um, business, but Walmart, I think, has, has a lower margins, but they have higher volume than Target. So, so you can compare one company to another. And this is what makes... Um, financial statement analysis incredibly powerful because you know when we just look at a balance sheet or an income statement of one company versus another and you see whole dollar amounts you might just say oh this company has you know more revenue than the other so it must be better or this company has more profit than the other one so it must be better and that's not necessarily the case right because <clears throat> Just because the number is bigger for revenue does or for profit doesn't necessarily mean that the percentages are, um, you know, are better, right? That the percentage of net income over revenue or whatever, however you want to calculate it, is better for one company versus another. It's, there are ways that you can kind of standardize the comparison between two companies and get really powerful information about how... Um, how these companies are doing in relation to each other. In fact, I just want to check to see if I'm remembering correctly uh, about something that's in the book that I can show you. Just give me a, a moment here. Yeah. I don't want to stop the share and then I'm not thinking about the right thing. Yeah, okay. So here's in the text. Um, let me see if I can just show you what I mean. Um, here we go, and it's under problems, and I think it's the last, it's the last, oh, sorry for whoever, uh, meme stocks, yes, meme stocks, uh, you're also talking about um, meme coins and meme stocks, absolutely. Um, so, oh, sorry, I think I've gone too far. Yeah, this is what I wanted to show you, right? So Target and Walmart. Now I'm not, I know what the answers to these questions are already because I mean, I've been teaching this class for a while, but I, I just wanna show you, we're not gonna do this question. I just wanna show you how difficult it can be sometimes to compare companies. Cause look at these numbers are in millions, right? So we're talking about actually billions billions of the B year. So net sales for Target is 65 billion. And then um, for Walmart is 408 billion. So if you just had to like base your decision 
making on something as simple as this one line item, or even on the net income number, you could just say, well, this company, you know, this is less money than this, so it must mean that Walmart is doing better. That's not necessarily the case, right? Remember what I said, Walmart uh, has a, a, a much lower margins. It could turn out that the profit margin, and this is actually what does happen, that the profit margin for Target is higher than, than Walmart. So, so when we do these ratios, what we're able to do is use a formula to kind of uh, reduce these numbers to percentages or, you know, a single dollar amount or something so that we can compare two companies, even though they're co almost completely different from each other in terms of the size of the company and the amounts, you know, the dollar amounts of certain line items, we can compare those two companies to each other and actually make strong decisions about whether we want to lend money to one versus the other or whether we want to invest in one versus the other and so on. All right. So <clears throat> you'll see in the... Um, in the textbook that there are three types of analysis that we can use with uh, financial statement analysis. We are definitely going to focus all our attention on ratio analysis, but I will just mention the other um, two types of analysis. So one is horizontal analysis, and you're looking at uh, financial statement data, you know, year over year over year. So you're going horizontally, you're saying, oh, I'm looking at 2021, 2020, 2019, 2018, and, and so on. So, um, you know, you're looking across um, and it's all to do with the, the company itself. And, and so let me see if I can show you, yeah, because we're not, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on this. So I'll just show you what it looks like. So now you're gonna ask, is this on the test? If we're not spending time on it, no. Um, I'm focusing on ratio analysis. So when I say horizontal analysis, this is what I mean. You're looking at numbers from one year, right, to the next to see how the company is doing and maybe also doing calculations like seeing what's the change in the number over a period of time. This is what I was doing with, um, with Sweet Green last night, saying, okay, so this is your, your revenue and, and what's been the change year over year. Okay, so the base year is 100 and then you can see the numbers been going up it went up by 9.1%, it went up, you know, 15.5, 23.8, 33.6. So you see there's definitely a, a consistent increase um, in the sales number, right? That's horizontal analysis that you could do for, um, for a company. Then the other one that we also do is vertical analysis. So vertical means you're going up and down, right? Evaluates financial statement data by expressing each item in a financial statement as a percentage of a base amount. So that sounds completely confusing. What does that mean? And again, all these things are um, available to you obviously in the textbook, let me just show you. So vertical analysis, this is what we mean over here. So basically what's happening here is you're treating total assets as the base number, that's 100%, and you're expressing every other number as a percentage of the base number. So total assets is 11,397, that's 100. So other assets is 50% of this number, right? Property, plant, and equipment is 26.2% of this number. Current assets is 23.8% of this number. So, I mean, this is useful to some extent to see, you know, how numbers relate to each other. Maybe it's also useful to see, um, you know, uh, cost of goods sold as a percentage of sales and so on. But um, these are things that you can easily uh, do in Excel and, and um, you know, get this information fairly quickly. So we don't spend a ton of time on this for our class. Uh, we spend more time looking at ratio analysis, which expresses the relationship um, among selected items of financial statement data. And so the ratios could be, you know, formulas that end up, um, you know, with all kinds of different expressions. And this is where we start talking about, you know, the different ratios. So what I'm gonna do is leave it there for today. I think we've done enough and I only have five minutes left. So starting, you know, going into, into these ratios now in, in the five minutes that's left, I'm, I'm, I don't think it's wise. I'd rather leave this time for any other questions that people may have. So, um, 
we're still tracking about half a half a session ahead because we're only supposed to start with with chapter 18 um next week so um for next week definitely we'll be diving deep into into um chapter 18 okay so you're dismissed unless anybody has any other questions for me you can uh, go and enjoy the lovely warm weather today i'll stop the